بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغيروا ما بأنفسهم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد There is no doubt that the Islamophobia and the hatred that we are witnessing on a daily basis towards the religion of Islam is increasing. And it will surely increase more as time goes on. Studies and statistics show that a great number of Americans do not trust Muslims and do not see that the religion of Islam is compatible with the United States Constitution and the American lifestyle. And there is a growing number of Americans that view the religion of Islam, they think the impression of the religion of Islam is that ISIS represents the religion of Islam. Taliban. Al-Qaeda represents the religion of Islam. And they actually think that these terrorists who are killing people in the name of the Quran and in the name of the religion of Islam, they are the ones who truly represent the religion of Islam. And we have seen the result of this type of thinking. Islamophobia, it's not a myth. It's a reality that we are witnessing, and especially here in this community, with the masjid that it was not allowed, they did not give permission for a masjid to be built here in Sterling Heights. Now, it's not a myth, and it's a reality. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This hatred that we are witnessing, it's a reality and it's very visible for anyone who wants to see. For anyone who pays attention, they will see that there is a growing fear of Muslims and hatred towards Muslims. And unfortunately, there is a lot of people who believe that 
who have these hateful feelings towards Muslims, and of course, they are armed. They go, they go walking places because the Constitution says it's okay to carry weapons. So the question is, what's the difference with these people who have a mentality that everyone else is wrong and they are right and they are armed? What's the difference with them and ISIS? What's the difference with them and the terrorists? And we've seen many incidents where Muslims, just because they're Muslims, or a woman, just because she is a lady, just because she is wearing the hijab, practicing the modesty of Islam, you see that she is attacked. And these incidents are growing day after the other. Now, the question is, where does this come from? Where does this Islamophobia come from? Did it just come out of nowhere? Is it just incidents that are happening in society that there was nothing to cause these? The answer is no. There are reasons for this Islamophobia. The first reason is no doubtedly, and we admit that there are a group of people in the name of the religion of Islam that are carrying out crimes against humanity and crimes against Muslims and non-Muslims alike in the name of the Quran and in the name of the religion of Islam. And we see them all over the news, ISIS, Taliban, Al-Qaeda. And these groups of people, they do not represent the religion of Islam. And you see, it is always the Muslims who are the first to condemn their criminal acts. It's always the Muslims who first condemn these evil acts against humanity, against Islam. And you see that most of the victims of these terrorists are who? They're Muslims themselves. So does that make sense? That in the name of the religion of Islam, and they are killing Muslims. Most of the victims are Muslims themselves. So how does it make sense that they are doing this in the name of the religion of Islam? When you go and you look at the reality, the reality of these terrorist organizations, you will see that they are politicians. They are politicians. They're trying to achieve power. They're trying to gain a seat. But sometimes a politician, they use one way to gain power and sometimes they use force. And these people, they are politicians. They're after power. Because if they were truly, truly worried about the religion of Islam, they wouldn't bomb and explode mosques. They wouldn't explode graves of the companions of the prophets. They wouldn't explode graves of some of the prophets. Some of the prophets, they bombed their graves and their shrines. Is this an act of a true Muslim? You see that these gra graves and these shrines, they have been around for over a thousand years. Suddenly a group of people, they came and they're destroying all of the graves and all of these shrines in the Middle East. So this group of people does not represent the religion of Islam and the Muslims they are the first to condemn their evil acts. Second, the second reason for this rising Islamophobia is the bigotry that we see in society. And unfortunately, we live in a very free society. We live in a free society, however, there are a lot of bigots and people that have so much hatred in their hearts. And this free society, and we see this on a daily basis. Someone, he wants to be a presidential candidate. He wants to achieve votes. What does he do to get, raising poll, to get rising poll numbers? He comes and he says, Islam, it's not compatible with the Constitution. Carson. And others, you see they talk against the religion of Islam on the channels these shows on the channels, in order to get publicity, in order to get ratings, they sit and attack the religion of Islam. Attacking Muslims. And this causes other people to go and attack innocent Muslims. And this is bigotry. If it's not bigotry, then I don't know what it is. It's bigotry, they're generalizing and accusing all Muslims of being terrorists. And this is definitely not true. But we see that this is very apparent. And this act of bigotry, it is what's causing 
It's causing more violence and more Muslims and Muslims to be attacked and abused. We see that only when a Muslim commits a crime, right away it's an Islamic problem. It's a Muslim problem. However, when someone else and who practices what happens to practice another religion commits a crime, you don't hear anything about it. A few weeks ago, there were shootings in the Oregon Community College. I was watching this. The police officer, they asked him, what's the name of the one who killed the students? He went into the community college and he began to shoot his classmates. He refused to say his name. Why did he refuse to say his name? Because that terrorist, he was not, he was not black, he was not Muslim, he was not from a minority, he happened to be a white person. He refused to mention his name. Isn't this bigotry? In the United States, in the year 2014, and this is according to the website of the FBI, Alhamdulillah, I don't visit it, but I had to visit it just to get this uh, statistic. In the, it says that during 2014, an estimated of 14,196 murders took place in the United States. 14,196. Did we hear the religion mentioned? Did we hear, the, did we hear anyone say which religion these people are from? The United States has, is filled with prisoners, criminals, that are in there because of, their, because of murdering. But the moment you hear a Muslim killed, it's all over the news. Everyone has to hear about it, and it suddenly becomes a Muslim problem. The question is, what do we have to do to satisfy these people? You see, the Muslims, they are very successful. Their children are educated. They pay their taxes. What, what else do you have to do? Muslims do not break the law. There are other groups of people that break the law more than the Muslims. But you see that there is this hatred towards Islam and towards the Muslims. What do you have to do to stop this? The third reason for this rising Islamophobia and this rising hatred towards Islam and the Muslims is that there is an agenda. There is an agenda against that is working against Islam and the Muslims. There was a study that said that on an annual basis, $57 million is invested just to bring down the name of the religion of Islam, just to create fear in the hearts of people in the name of the religion of Islam. And you can look this up. So much money is invested. There's actually companies and people, influential people in the government that put money so that people have fear of the religion of Islam and people have fear of Muslims. They tell you Muslims, they want to take over the world and they will kill anyone who does not believe in their belief system or scaring people with this Sharia Allah. Sharia Allah, you hear everyone talking about it, but you see if you ask one person, if you ask some of them, even some of the ones who are who are candidates to be presidents of the United States. You ask them, what is Sharia Allah? They won't know. They won't have the details of Sharia Allah and the religion of Islam. But you hear it constantly mentioned. Now, let's analyze. What is Sharia Allah? What is it? We constantly hear it being mentioned. Even, unfortunately, you see some Muslims, they are misled. Because many Muslims, alhamdulillah, you don't see them attending the masjid, you don't see them coming and learning about their religion, and they'll probably take their religion from Fox News and from these media channels. So you see many people, many Muslims are confused themselves. Many Muslims, they actually think Islam is a religion that was spread by the sword and Islam is against women, Islam oppresses and abuses people. And this is why we need to educate ourselves. What is Sharia Allah? First of all, when you see the religion of Islam, you see that contrary to other groups of religions, contrary to, for example, Christianity and other religions, of course not all of Christians, but a group of them, 
the religion of Islam, it does not even view that I have to convert other people to the religion of Islam. It's not an obligation for me. I don't go knocking on people's doors and telling them convert to the religion of Islam. We don't, there's, there's, yes, it's good to guide people. It's good to show people the truth. But I don't believe that I have to convert everyone to the religion of Islam. And we see that even during the time of Rasulullah there were many people who were non-Muslims. They were living in a Muslim community with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allah says, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ You have your faith and I have my faith. There's nothing wrong with that. In another verse, Allah says, وَقُلُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ He who wants to believe, they could believe. And he who does not want to believe, they're not forced to believe. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not force people to join the religion of Islam. Because the day Rasulullah passed away, he had power, but there were Christians and there were Jews that were living within the Muslim community. In another verse, Allah says in the Quran, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغيب There is no compulsion. There is no force in religion. Now this has two meanings. One, is that you should not force other people to join your religion. This is wrong. And the other meaning is that you cannot, even if you try, la ikraha fi din. You cannot. Can I force someone to love someone else? Can I force someone to hate someone else? No, because this is a feeling in the heart. And the religion and faith, it's also in the heart. You cannot change someone's heart by forcing them. Through force, you cannot change someone's belief system. However, when you look at other communities, when you look at other religions, you see there was colonialism. For many years, colonialism, what was it for? Was it just for taking and stealing the money and the resources of, com of, of countries? No. It also had a reason that let's convert these people because these people, their religion is worthless. Their religion is nothing. At any cost, if we have to kill these people, if we have to annihilate whole communities, let's do it. And we see that under the excuse of the cross and Christianity, and of course this is not Christianity, this is not the teaching of Jesus. This is not what Jesus wanted. But you see that under the cross, millions were killed. Millions were annihilated. Here, America... It had Native Americans. Where are they now? Do you run into Native Americans when you're driving, when you're walking around? You don't even see them. They're extinct. Because of this hegemonic practice of spreading our belief system. Was it the Muslims that did this? No. You look in other countries today in Palestine. Why are they being killed? Why are they being kicked out of their homes? Why are their homes being demolished over their heads? The only reason is that they're Muslim. But you see that this is not called terrorism here. It's only called terrorism when it's committed, when the crime is committed by Muslims. However, when we look at the religion of Islam, we see that the religion of Islam is tolerant towards other religions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he was tolerant. Allah how many times in the Quran says, O oh people of the book, ya ahl al-kitab. That means Allah acknowledges them. That means they have a right to be and they have a right to live in the community. And you go and you look in the Muslim communities. In the Muslim countries, Christians have been living with Muslims. And Jews have been living with Muslims. And other people of different faiths, they, all, they have all been living together. The religion of Islam did not exterminate and kill anyone who believes in another religion. In fact, the greatest sin in the religion of Islam is what? It's shirk, associating a partner with Allah. But you see that even a mushrik is accepted. Even a mushrik, someone who associates a partner with Allah, this person, he is accepted in the Muslim society. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكْ فَأَجِرْهُ 
even if one of the mushrikeen, he came to seek refuge to you, O Rasulullah, give him refuge. Give that person refuge. Give that person aman. And this is what Rasulullah did. Isn't this what Rasulullah did to Abu Sufyan and his family? He freed them and he let them go, he let them live. So the religion of Islam is very tolerant. But you see that there's an agenda that's working against the religion of Islam. So this is the first point regarding Sharia Allah. I don't believe that I have to force my Sharia ah upon other people. The second, what exactly is the Sharia? Ah? What is the code? What is the laws of the religion of Islam? You see that the religion of Islam, it has a legal system. Just like other religions, they have a legal system. The Catholics, they have a legal system by the name of the canon law. And the Jews, they have a legal system by the name of Halakha law. Halakha law. This is, these are legal systems of other religions. Why are they allowed? Why do we not hear Fox News and other networks attacking these other legal systems, religious legal systems? And why is it only the religion of Islam that's constantly being attacked? And then you come and you look at these legal systems. You look at Sharia Allah, you see that it's divided into two categories. There is one set of laws that pertain to an individual. For example, I choose, I'm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders me to refrain from eating pork. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders me to refrain from alcohol. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders me to practice modesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders me to eat halal food, meaning that the blood and the germs and all of this filth leaves the body of the animal that has been slaughtered. Now, what's the problem if I come and I'm practicing this law? What's the problem of me practicing modesty? What's the problem when a Muslim woman decides to wear the hijab? Is it wrong? Is it going against the teachings of the Constitution? No. You see that the Constitution, the first thing it orders, the first thing that it speaks about was that religious freedom. And people came to the United States to seek religious freedom. But why is it that when it comes to a Muslim, it becomes a wrong thing and it becomes something wrong? In the name of being open-minded, in the name of Western civilization and democracy, you see, I read this, in France, right now, they're trying to force the Muslim students and the Jewish students to eat pork at schools. At schools, they bring them pork and they say, you have to eat this because this is secularism. You have to be secular. Is this truly freedom? Or when a woman is not allowed to practice hijab, is this truly freedom? Why is it okay? Why is it considered freedom when a woman wants to walk around almost naked that's considered freedom. You, you respect that. You accept that. Why do you not respect it when she wants to cover herself? Why is, it, why is it then not freedom? You see the double standards. Another issue, the second category regarding Sharia Allah, is that there are laws that the religion of Islam and the Quran and Rasulullah brought for the protection of society as a whole. And these are the penal laws. Sometimes there are some laws that the religion of Islam, because the religion of Islam, it came in a society where there was no government. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he formed his own government. There was no civilization in Arabia before the religion of Islam. He came and he brought that civilization. People were, there was no law. At nighttime, there was no safety, there was no security. The murderers, they're walking around. One tribe raids another tribe. One group of people, they come and they steal the woman from that, from that tribe. The religion of Islam, it came and it brought a justice system. It brought laws so that people can live safely with one another. So that people can feel protected. And yes, some of these laws, for example, the religion of Islam, one of the laws of the religion of Islam is the laws of Qasas. When someone kills, this person is killed if there are witnesses. Now someone might come and say this is unjust and the religion of Islam just wants to kill and the religion of Islam wants to seek revenge. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقَصَاصِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُلِي الْأَلْبَابِ With qasas, you will find hayat, you will find peace. You will actually be able to live. And when we look at the society that, that was practiced, of course, not, this is not the way it's practiced right now by ISIS and these thugs in the name of the religion of Islam. When it was practiced by Rasulullah and by the Imams and during the short period where there was actually real Islam being practiced during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, you see that Muslims were safe. Muslims were safe to walk. They say that a female can walk from one city to another city without feeling threatened. This was the safety that the religion of Islam brought. And of course these laws, these laws they're applied. Now we're not coming and saying that religion because these laws have to be applied in the United States. Because even Muslim scholars, even Muslim scholars they say that these laws they are applied in a Muslim majority community, a Muslim majority society, when the people, they vote to live by that law. And doesn't this make sense? Isn't this a democratic country where you're allowed to vote for a law that you wish to live by? Some people, they wish, they wish to vote for some laws. This is what democracy calls for. And we see that this has not only happened in the religion of Islam. It's not the religion of Islam that's to blame because of these laws. For example, you see Iran. Iran, they were Muslims before the revolution and they're Muslims after the revolution. Before the revolution, they chose not to practice these laws. After the revolution, the whole government, the whole community, the whole nation, they stood, they had a revolution, they decided to live by some laws that they voted for, their parliament voted for. What's wrong with that? If they decide to live by laws, the whole community, the whole society decides to live by a law, why is it wrong? And you see, this is not only where Muslims are living. You see that this happens in a Christian country. You see that this happens, for example, in India. A few days ago, there was a man, a few days after Eid al-Adha, in a city in India who was killed. Why? Because they thought that he had ate meat. He had, they thought that he had beef in his house. And they killed him. And they, they killed him in a very bad way. Because there is a law in that city that you're not allowed to eat beef. The whole community, the whole government at that time, they voted for that law. Now do we see anyone coming and saying these people are cruel and they're forcing people not to eat beef? We don't see anyone mentioning these laws. But when it comes to the religion of Islam, you see the Muslims are attacked. And other places, many other places. This is very common in a democratic society. People, they vote to live and, you, and practice a law that they feel that is befitting for them. And you see also some Muslim countries, they don't practice some of these religious laws. Some of these laws that the Quran speaks about. They don't practice it. They voted not to practice it. So, why is it Islam that's to blame? And then you come and you see that these laws, that you're coming and attacking the religion of Islam. For example, you hear some people go on TV and they say Islam advocates stoning. Well, guess what? Stoning is not even mentioned in the Quran. You know where it's mentioned? It's mentioned in the Old Testament. Go and read your own book before you come and attack the religion of Islam. But the problem is today, you see many people, they don't even know what the Quran is. They just hear Islam, Sharia Allah, Jihad. And they're coming and attacking these, the Muslims and creating fear without even reading. Without even reading the history and the actual rulings of the religion of Islam. So, Islam is not to blame. And these laws... They are there to protect society. If you choose to live for, with them, you live with them. If you don't choose to live with them, a community chooses not to live with them. And many of these qasas laws, our scholars, they say that <coughs> they are practiced only when the Imam al-Adil is around. Only when the true, rightful, just leader, when there is a just government, these laws are allowed to be implemented. For example, scholars, they say that the religion of Islam 
says as sarik wa sarika faqtahu aydihuma the thief of course there are conditions there are hundreds of conditions many conditions not anyone who is a thief they come and they cut off his hand for example someone has to break a lock someone has to not be hungry they cannot many many conditions they have to be met for that law to to be applied and also one of the conditions is that for example there has to be no poverty in society another condition is that the imam al-adil has to be around why because the imam al-adil he is the only one who is able to make sure that all the laws are being applied equally so right now scholars they say that's not applied but of course you see some governments they are competing with ISIS, the Saudi government. It's competing with ISIS how many beheadings they can have in a year. ISIS wants, they're, they're beheading people and this government is beheading people. They're bombing innocent people. And then a few days ago with the United Nations, they want to vote for crim laws against humanity, criminal laws that criminal acts of war that have been taken place by the Saudi government, who was the first government that came and protected them? It was America. It was Britain. They protected Saudi Arabia. And then the religion of Islam is accused of being a terrorist religion, a violent religion. Go solve the problem with your friend, the one that the president is dancing with their king. Go and solve that problem, and then you will stop these terrorists. Because who's financing these terrorists? You look at every single terrorist organization. Who's starting them? Who's feeding them? Who's giving them? You see it's coming from the countries, from the Gulf. But then it becomes a Muslim problem. Fourth reason for the spread of Islamophobia is the lack of activism within the Muslims. We Muslims, we are also to blame. Because we don't do anything. We see Rasulullah being attacked. We see our values being attacked. We don't do anything about it. And there are two groups of Muslims. We have two choices. Either one choice is that we sit around and we complain the religion of Islam is being attacked. And then we get excited when an actor or when someone goes and says something beautiful about the Muslims. We get very excited. We see, see how these people are defending the religion of Islam. And then we also have another option, and that is to do something. To actually stand and defend our faith. To defend our belief system. And this is what's expected of us if we are true Muslims. Because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to change our matters. Let me sit and complain for years and months and days if I'm just complaining and I'm not doing anything nothing is going to change and the beauty of the society that we're living in is that there is an opportunity for change there is an opportunity to change the situation in society unlike the Middle East where one-fourth of the population is killed off and half of the population they're kicked out of the country and they have to go become refugees and you see the dictators and the tyrants they're still there for 30 years here there's actually room for change there is all there is a way to change it just requires work it just requires participation it just requires himma just yesterday there was an election in canada and the Prime Minister, who was very conservative, and his whole agenda during his campaign was against the hijab. As if there's nothing else to talk about. His whole agenda was against the hijab. You see that the Muslims, they came out and they voted. And today, he lost his seat. This is, this is work. And this is what's required of us. This is what we have to do. We have to have the will, willpower to change. We have to believe that we can change, and we are able to change. There are many good things that have also happened in the United States and in the West. We shouldn't only focus about the negative things and how the religion of Islam is being attacked. We actually have freedom here. We can actually go to a court and seek our rights here, because it is our right 
to, act, to practice our religion freely. And you see, many good things have happened. For example, last Eid in New York, which is probably one of the most important cities in America and in the West, the day of Eid is a day where all of the schools are on holiday. And the Muslim kids, because of the Muslim kids who are a minority, all of the schools, the whole public school system in New York City, they took a holiday, closed. Isn't this something good? This is because a few people, they actually voiced their opinion. They actually said, we are Muslims, we also deserve rights. Just like everyone else deserves rights. So, we have to actually work. <coughs> But unfortunately, you see some people, as soon as you tell them, come and change, come and do something, right away they start bringing conspiracy theories. No, you could not do anything. It's the Zionists, it's this and that. Yes, how did they have power? How did they take power? They got power because they actually used the process. We also have to use the process, my dear brothers and sisters. When there's an election, go out and vote because the congressmen and the officials, they only listen to the one who votes. They're not going to listen to someone who does not vote. No matter how much you cry, no matter how much you say, if you're not going to vote, they don't even, you're, you don't even exist. But the day you begin to vote, that's the day that they will listen to you. So actually participate. And second, use the resources available. Right now there is social networking. There is a lot of resources that we have available, but we see that we're busy wasting our time with other things. Use the resources that you have available for you. Be active. Take the initiative to defend your faith and defend your religion. Because if I don't defend my religion and my faith right now, how can I guarantee that my children will be able to practice freely? Maybe right now I say it's not a big deal, it's not a problem. But how can I guarantee the that my, my children and my grandchildren will be able to actually practice here, the religion. We have to defend our faith. We have to stand, we have to voice our opinion. And when we gather during Muharram, we teach ourselves. We take lessons on how to defend our faith. How to stand for our belief system. This is what the whole Muharram is. Why are we gathered here? Because Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he voiced his opinion. It just started with a word. He voiced his opinion. He said, Inna Yazid, Rajulun Fasiq, Sharib, Wal Khamr, Qatil, Al Nafs, Al Muhtaramah, Mithli, La Yubayah, Mithla. I cannot vote for Yazid. That was it. Imam al Hussein, he chose not to vote for Yazid. And the companions of Imam al Hussein, they chose to not give legitimacy to that corrupt government, because that government, it was trying to corrupt the religion of Islam. And tonight, we remember one of the loyal, one of the brave warriors of Ashura, who was Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, the brother of Imam al Hussein, the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen. <coughs> this brother of Imam al Hussein. He had such a high position. He is so honored. The Imams that, af that came after him, they used to remember Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. There were many shuhada on the day of Ashura. But al-Abbas, he has a special position in the eyes of the Imams. The Imam says in the ziyarah, Ashhadu annaka lam tahin wa lam tankul wa annaka madayta ala basiratin min amrik مُقْتَدِيًا بِالصَّالِحِينَ وَمُتَّبِعًا لِلنَّبِيِّينَ You did not break. In times where people break, that was the time that Al-Abbas did not break. That brave soldier. That loyal brother to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. You know Al-Abbas, he was able to drink the water. After three days of not drinking the water, he actually went and he penetrated through the army and he was in the Farat. He places his hands in the water. He brings it close and his, his lips are dry. He's thirsty. It's been such a long time he hasn't drank water. As he brings the water close to him, that moment is what defined Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. 
that moment, he was able to drink the water. But he said, how can I drink the water when the son of Fatima is thirsty? How can I drink the water when the children of Imam al Hussein are yelling, Wa When the children are thirsty, how can I drink water? And he drops the water in the river. He fills the canteen. This was Al Abbas. After seeing that Imam al Hussein salam, was left all alone, it was only Al Abbas. Al Abbas. And the one who died after him was Ali al-Azhar. All of the companions. He gave his brothers. He told his brothers to go one after the other and defend Imam al Hussein. These are the sons of Umm al-Baneen. Umm al-Baneen, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he married Umm al-Baneen so that she has children so that they can protect Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura. Al-Abbas, his life, it revolved around protecting Imam al Hussein And he made sure that he protected the Imam of his time and the family of his Imam until his last breath. The children, they're crying. He tells Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he tells him, Oh Abba Abdullah, oh my master. He used to never call him my brother until one moment, until when he was about to die. He tells him, Oh my master, please allow me to go and bring water. Please allow me to fight. Imam al Hussein tells him, If you have to fight, then bring water. But the Imam, he could not let go of Al Abbas. He tells him, Ya Akha, Anta al Alamatu min Askari, Wa Anta Sahib Niwai, Faida Kutil Tashatta Tajamuna. He was the last one. But Imam al Hussein tells him, You are my army. If you die, who is going to protect us? Who will protect the daughters of Fatima after you? But Al Abbas, he was on a mission to quench the thirst of the children of Aba Abdullah. There's a poem that says, In Kana Saqin Nas. في الحشر حيدر فساقي عطاشا كربلا أبو الفضل إمام الحسين عليه السلام he sent أبو الفضل and أبو الفضل he goes out calling his name and telling them to stand in front of him whoever they are he's going to go لا أرهب الموت إذا الموت زغى حتى أوارى في المصاليت لقى نفسي لنفس الطاهر الطهر وقا إني أنا العباس أغدو بالسقا ولا أخاف الشر يوم الملتقى He goes and he penetrates through the army until he reaches the farat. He fills the canteen of water and then he brings the water to his face, then he remembers the thirst of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He begins reciting, Ya nafsu min ba'd al Hussein huni, wa ba'dahu la kunti aw takuni. Had al Hussein warid al manuni, wa tashrabin barid al ma'ini. He begins to go back to the camp of Imam al Hussein. Omar ibn Saad, he calls the army. He has 4,000 men surrounding Al Abbas. He tells them if the water reaches the camp of Hussein, you all will be killed. They surround him from all corners. A man, he hides behind a tree as Al Abbas is passing. Strikes Al Abbas on his right hand. His hand falls, but Al Abbas is determined to go forward. And he says, Wallahi, in Qatar to Muyamini, in Neo Hami, Abada 
الشمع ديني وعن إمام صادق اليقين نجل النبي الطاهر الأميني He keeps going forward until a cruel wicked man strikes him on his left hand They begin to rain his body with arrows He starts saying يا نفس لا تخشي من الكفار وأبشري برحمة الجبار ببغيهم قد قطعوا يساري فأصلهم يا رهب حر النار They begin to rain his body with arrows He has no hands to defend himself Suddenly an arrow pierces the canteen of water The water spills The water that he had not tasted at all it spills Another arrow falls on his eyes And Abbas he brings his head down To take the arrow out with his knees Suddenly a wicked man He strikes him on his head And Abbas falls on the ground There are no hands to protect him The arrows they go deeper in his body Ahmed al Hadid من هاشم فلتبكيه عليا مضر أو ما سمعت عن سرجه العباس خار إمام الحسين يرشس أبا الفاض he sees his hands are on the ground the canteen is broken there's an arrow in his eyes إمام الحسين he stands in front of him and he holds one hand on his sword which is down, he's leaning on it. Another hand, he's holding his side. He says, Al-An in Kasara Dahri. Now my back has been broken by the loss of my brother Abel Fahd. Al-Abbas, that moment was the first moment he said, Akhi, Adrik, Akhaq. He used to always call Imam Al-Hussein, Oh, Master. Now he said, Oh, my brother, I need your help. Imam al Hussein, he comes to Al Abbas, he places his head in the lap of Imam al Hussein, in his lap, and then he begins to wipe the dirt and the blood from the face of Al Abbas. That moment, Al Abbas, he begins to cry. Imam al Hussein tells him, Why are you crying? He says, I cry because right now my head is in your lap. In one hour or earlier, had me, O oh, Abba Abdullah, even the last moment. He's thinking of his brother Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein tells him, Oh, my dear brother, let me take you back to the camp. Imam al Hussein, Al Abbas, he tells Imam al Hussein, Oh, my dear brother, leave me here. Imam al Hussein tells him, Why? Let me take you back to the camp. Al Abbas says, I'm, I'm embarrassed to go back and see Sukaina and the children when I had not brought them. يا أخوي حسين خليني بمجاني يقل له لي أشياء زهرة زماني يقل له واحد جزكنا تراني العباس is in the lap of Imam Al Hussein he takes his last breath and his soul departs his body رحم الله من نادى what happened to Al-Abbas? It was how Imam al Hussein was all alone now. He has no one to protect him. They see Imam al Hussein walking back to the tents. You can't give for the mu'ahu bikummeh. Wiping his sleeves, with wiping his tears with his sleeve. The women, the children, they come to him. Ain Ammun Al-Abbas. Where is Abbas? Imam al Hussein, he goes. He cannot tell them what has happened. He goes to the tent of Abbas and he brings it down. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-aliy al-azim inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon 
Let us raise our hands in dua by the love of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. This great man, Al-Abbas, he has a position in the eyes of Allah. Anyone who is sick, do tawassul, turn to Allah through the love and the position of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He is loyal, he was loyal with Imam al Hussein. he will also be loyal with us. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات Let us also recite this verse three times. There's a brother that is doing surgery tomorrow and there's many that have asked us for dua. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ شوفوا السوء أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السوء والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين